everybody. Uh, my name is John Dunn, AWR. And what I'd like to do today is uh, talk about the merging, if you will, of two different technologies in electromagnetics uh, and how we deal with them in our software. And the issue is the following. Uh, if you use electromagnetic simulators and you're a circuit designer, you're in this world usually, which is the method of moments. Uh, planar simulators, board, package, module, chip. Planar dielectric layers with metal and vertical vias. The trouble is, as you're aware, uh, more and more you have to use 3D simulators this world over here on the right, and in that world, uh, you have to deal with your BGA balls, bond wires, holes in dielectrics, end of the dielectric, SMA connectors, typical 3D shapes, uh, and you would need a finite element method or something equivalent because the planar solvers uh, can't draw it, they can't simulate it. So uh, I think we're all aware of that, and there are a variety of options out there. We have ours, they have theirs. Well, I'm not going to talk about the simulator today. Uh, I thought it would be fun to kind of change it up a little bit and put you in the position of someone designing the user interface of the software. So the problem you've got is your software, microwave office in our case, is essentially a planar world. So all of our layout, when you're laying your chipboard module package out is planar. And yet, you have to be over here sometimes. So how does the software deal with drawing in here when basically all of your uh, software is set up to be in there? Uh, the traditional answer here is what you do is you don't connect the two at all. And so what you do is you go out to your 3D simulator, redraw everything, define the layers, draw it all, simulate, get the S parameters, and bring them back in. There's no connectivity between them. Not, uh, not a very good answer. And I want to show you what we're doing in uh, Microwave Office to get at this. So again, here we are. Most of our world, as you're all aware, 2D. Package, board, module, chip. And yet, I want to be able to work with that in a 2D world. How do I deal with it? Well, let's start with the 2D world here, layers. What can you do just kind of extending 2D shapes? And the answer is you can take a 2D shape and you can go up and you can go down. That's about all you can do, okay? And so what you can do with that is it's very easy to, for example, uh, make finite dielectrics. You could take a shape and extend down, it's dielectric. You can make holes in dielectrics. You could take a hole, subtract it. And you can do thick metal, but you're not going to get to this guy. So what's the next trick? Well, at some point, if you're really going to draw that SMA connector, 3D shape, you, of course, have to have a 3D editor. And here's ours. Uh, this is for our analyst product. This is brand new, released six weeks ago. If you're used to any 3D editor, this should look very familiar. You would draw here, materials, properties here. Uh, a lot of it is parameter controlled, so the number of turns in the coil, et cetera. Pretty standard stuff. You can script it if you wish to. Um, I said we wanted this to really exist in the 2D world. How do you do that? That's the trick. And here's how we do it. Uh, what you do at your companies is normally, our argument is, you're not normally not drawing a lot of these shapes. I bet you as a circuit designer, when you do 3D simulators, I bet you use about six shapes. You're going to do an SMA connector a BGA ball, a bond wire, a tapered via, a ground strap, and a couple others. And that's going to be about it. And then a couple of you do some packaging. And that's it. You are not drawing an F-16 airplane as a circuit design. Okay? If you are, you're not using our software. All right? 
So our philosophy is let's face that fact and take advantage of it. How do you take advantage of it? Well, the secret is that that uh, SMA connector or this coil, we never have you draw it. So what we do is over here, we have a library of all these pre-configured shapes you're going to use. You simply drag them into the 2D layout, change the parameters, number of turns, et cetera, as you wish, and you're done. Okay, and I'll show you some examples of this in a second. I know what you're thinking is, well, wait a minute, I've got a different connector and it's not in John's library, so this isn't going to work. That's true. You then are free to go back to the 3D editor, create the cell, save it in the library, very easy to do, and then all of your colleagues can forevermore use it. So our vision is you're going to have one person draw that thing and then everyone's going to use it forevermore. All right? Um, the parameters in the 3D editor, you can quickly bring them in. Uh, and here I'm just demonstrating change these things and things change. Now, of course, this depends on how bright the person was who made the cell, right? Once you put the cell on the 2D editor, how do you move it around? Well, it's actually very easy. If you just want to move it on a layer, of course, you just move it. Uh, you also, just through a menu, you can rotate 90 degrees. You can move it up and down. Uh, it doesn't have to be 90, actually. It could be any angle you want. So the 3D cell can be oriented in a 3D world on a planar environment. Here's this example right here of a coiled whip antenna. Uh, which we actually have running in, over in our booth if you want to see it. This is two cells that I just grabbed. Uh, that is actually a coax line sticking through the ground plane. Change the parameters. That's a simple coil. I rotated it and attached it. I drew this in our editor in 30 seconds because I had the cells. I'm done. I'm in a 2D world. I made a 3D shape. So I got the cells. I never went out to this editor. I don't need to. Over here, I had mentioned, uh, this is kind of neat too. There's a couple other concepts here. If you're going to be going in a 2D piece of software and using 3D that they never had to deal with when they just had 3D. Now let me give you an example of this. When you use our layout, you have layers. They traditionally don't have layers in 3D simulators unless you put them in there. We always have layers, right? because we're on chip package board. How, and then I'm going to put shapes on the layers, in the layers. How do the precedence rules work? If you've ever dealt with these tools, there's always the issue when two shapes intersect, who wins? Is it air? Is it FR4? And, and most of you are younger than me. I'm old enough to remember the early days. You actually literally had to subtract the shapes from one another and make a third. It was horrible, OK? Then they said, hey, wait a minute. If the guy's putting gold inside FR4, he probably wants gold. All right, they figured that out. Well, what we do, it's cool, is we now have these layers from the 2D editor. They always get the lowest priority. You say, OK. Well, remember my air hole in a dielectric? That dielectric that I just drew very easily by extrusion is air going into FR4. But since the FR4 is the background layers, the air wins. I just made a hole. I don't have to subtract anything. And normally, with precedence, air is going to lose. But it automatically wins here. So we figured out, when you're doing 3D shapes in 2D, what, what the logical precedence rules are. What about ports? Now, that's a weird one. In 3D editors, of course, you add ports by wave ports, et cetera. How do you add a 3D port in a 2D editor? Well, here's how we do it. The 3D cell, when you create it, you define the wave ports. They're right here. See one, and you, I think you can see two. He's kind of in here. Then when I use it in the 2D editor, here's a 3D view of this, I just go ahead and move my cursor here and say, place a port. I'm allowed to put a port wherever it was in the 3D editor, but I don't have to. OK? So I'm done. And so that is a wave port that your finite element solver is going to use. You never went to the 3D editor. 
Uh, hierarchy, here's kind of an interesting one that uh, most, uh, most 3D tools don't get into. When you're in a circuit simulator environment, we're all using sub-circuits, layout cells, sub-cells, right? <clears throat> well, you can do that in EM. So the way you do it is over here you can see uh, here we are at the highest level. In this case, I'm seeing a chip bond wires over to a quad uh, flat no lead package, QFN package. Again, I, I didn't draw any of the 3D pre-configured cell for the package. As you come down here, you see how this is indented, the QFN? That is actually a subcell, a subcircuit, of, if you will, of the top level. Okay? And that shows it right here. Now you see all these ports the person added connected to the bond wires? If they simulate at this level, they get those and would get all those S parameters. On the other hand, if they simulate at this top level, maybe they only had two ports and they get that. So it flattens everything below it. You can reuse things. You can go to the small level and you can go to the high level. So hierarchy is a really nice concept that now we have since we have this circuit environment, layout environment with sub-circuits. Boundary conditions. How do we deal with boundary conditions? Uh, normal 3D editor course at the boundary for finite elements, you've got to put boundary conditions. Here's how we do it. Uh, in the 2D editor, there is a box uh, which you can change its shape to what you want. It doesn't have to be a box. But what happens when I put this 3D cell here of the SMA connector with its port. How does that work? The answer is quite simple. If the cell is inside the boundary box, it ignores the boundaries of the cell because it says, well, you're inside your box. We don't need it. If, this, if it extends outside like this designer did, we simply assume that this person wanted the boundary conditions where the outer part of the connector is to be copper. So they're automatically done for you. The box boundary extends when objects stick outside. The port is automatically a wave port and you're done. So you're actually able to mix uh, boundary conditions very effectively uh, and easily. Here's, I'll finish up by a couple minutes left. I'll finish up with a couple simple examples. Uh, this was uh, drawn and simulated in our software. Uh, it's going from a board with a wave port up the BGA ball, over to the bond wire to the chip through a, um, a module. And the thing I want to emphasize here is this was drawn in a 2D editor. This person never went to a 3D editor to draw that. How did they do the ba uh, balls and the bond wires? They never drew them. They were P-cells. They just grabbed them in. If they want to change the uh, shape of the bond wire, they have a little menu, they can do it, etc. So very easy, no need to leave the 2D environment. Here is an example of a mimic in a quad flat no lead package. And what we've got here is the mimic, of course, was first of all simulated as a raw chip using harmonic balance. This now is one of those P cells, the quad flat pack, and they simulate that, again, all in the 2D editor. Here's the mimic performance power out and the curve here is with the package. We see a big degradation due to the package. That package has a resonance at 9.5 gigahertz, so you have to change it. Uh, another example, I've shown you this SMA example. Um, and again, what they're doing now is optimizing the line width for the launch, and they get improved performance. I think I showed you this picture before. This is my little coiled antenna. I never drew it. It's just two shapes. I rotate very quick, get the antenna patterns, uh, et cetera. So in conclusion, how do you get drawing 3D shapes in a 2D environment, which any circuit simulator world is? The answer is you don't. You use P cells. It's easy to do. When you don't have the P cell, you go into the 3D editor. It's all hooked up with the rest of the software draw that P-cell, all of your colleagues can use it, and 
we can avoid the 3D editor issue and get on to designing, which is what we all want to do anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you.